All right, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you very much for joining us today on our webinar with called What to Expect When Reopening. We are joined with a great group of people today. We've got some good topic, conver topic of conversation for us, and I'd like to introduce myself and my co-host today. I'm Jay Nephew, and with me today I have Dottie San Martin. Welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining us. And today we're going to talk with our four guests about their reopening experience. Um, you know, as we navigate through today's challenging times, we come together as a group to offer advice, guidance, and best practices from Cubica AMAP. In this webinar, we've invited Bowling Center owners and operators who have been lucky enough to uh, reopen their business. And they're gonna help offer you a view and hear directly from each one of them uh, to their peers about what it was like for them to reopen and hopefully give you a bit of foreshadowing of what to expect if you have not reopened yourself. Or maybe you can share your reopening experiences or, or confirm them with us with, with your panel. Let's get right into the introduction of the panel today because we have a, um, a seasoned group today. So we'll start off with a gentleman who began his career as a concourse attendant. I have to just advance my slide here momentarily. I apologize. Yeah, he began his career as a concourse attendant, and then he quickly moved on to learn uh, the mechanic side of the game. He also became a pro shop operator, and now he is the bowling supervisor for Sovereign Nation at Angel of the Wind Casino. Uh, please welcome Strikers General Manager, Mr. Dustin Russell. Hi, Dustin. Hey, Jay. Hey, Dottie. Hi. Thank Thanks you. for being with us today. My pleasure. Thank you. And I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome Mike Davis. He is the owner of Camel Lanes in Gillette, Wyoming. And Mike has been an integral part of the bowling community for many years. As president of the Wyoming Bowling Proprietors Association for 15 years, director of Wyoming State USBC Board for 25 years, and director on the Gillette USBC board for 30 years. And most recently, I would like to congratulate Mike for being named the 2020 Bowling Proprietors Association of America Proprietor of the Year. Welcome, Mike. Woo! Well, congratulations, you, Mike. Thank you. Very humbling. You're welcome. Uh, our next participant today, panelist, uh, started out as a porter in 1993 with AMS, and he never looked back. Uh, he's a PBA champion, and he's the national amateur champion from 2000, I'm going to say five, it might be wrong, but it's either five or six. He also served multiple years uh, with Team USA and the United States Bowling Congress Board of Directors. He most recently was a district manager for Bolero before he decided to live his life dream out and buy a center in January of this year. Uh, the, gen the owner and general manager and cook and dishwasher and everything from Saber Lanes in Wisconsin, Mr. Dan Patterson. <laughs> Hi, y'all. I feel like I'm going on match game. This is exciting. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for being here, Dan. And our last participant, our last panelist for today is Scott Holmes. And Scott comes to us with 31 years of experience from Southwestern Bell and AT&T in engineering and technical sales. And in 19, or I'm sorry, in 2013, he and his wife, Janet, who incidentally, according to Scott, is the real boss, uh, purchased mm -hmm. Tomball Bowl in Tomball, Texas. And uh, Scott and Janet just are finishing phase two of a big remodel at Tomball despite this pandemic. And um, they're getting ready for phase three, which is gonna add about 10,000 uh, 10, square feet uh, in two new attractions. So I can say that uh, Scott and Janet are all in. So welcome, Scott. Welcome, Thank you. Scott. All right, let's go over the agenda for today. We're going to have our discussion with our panelists about their reopening experience, but we'll also offer, um, allow for questions and answers. If you have anything you'd like to ask our participants or all the participants, anybody in general, you can type it in your chat box. And Kyle Calcote, who is our webinar master, he's on the back end listening and taking uh, control of those questions, admitting you all into the meeting, et cetera. We will also have a closing statement and we'll talk about some resources that we have available. So let's get right into it. You know, um, 
you guys have all had an opportunity to open up and, and that's really a bonus for many of you because in so many parts of the country, bowling centers still have not been able to open. So I'd like to ask each one of you and I'll start right off the bat with Dustin. How, um, when did you get to reopen your doors or did you not have to close Dustin? No, we did have to close. Uh, we closed for about 10 weeks approximately. Um, okay. and we reopened our doors, um, on the 29th, so it's about two weeks ago. All right, how about you, uh, Mike? When did you get to reopen? We opened uh, April 30th, so we've we've been at it a while, and uh, it's, the response has been amazing from our customers. Awesome, we're gonna get into that in just a minute. Dan, when did you get to reopen? Recently, right? Yeah, two weeks, same as Justin. Two Justin, weeks, sorry, okay, Justin. awesome. And Scott, you're open now also. How long have you been open? Uh, three weeks, we opened May 22nd. May 22nd, great. All right, so you, uh, what are the best practices and tools that you guys have utilized for your reopening? I know we, we, there's a lot of support out there from the industry. So we've got the BPAA site, we've got our site, you know, you've got uh, IAPA, et cetera. And I'd like to know from you guys, if, did you take advantage of any of those, the content on all, any of those sites? We'll start with Dan. Oh, absolutely, especially the BPA site and then, and of course, through your guys' webinars. This is kind of uncharted territory, and I sounds like we've all been in the bowling industry a long time, and I made this joke the other day, of course, internally, that I've probably put my fingers into, I don't know, two million bowling ball holes cleaning up on Rock and Bowl, and I've never once cut <laughs> the holes of a bowling ball. And so, I mean, that was kind of, and now it's kind of a no-brainer. We're at least going to do that more often. I don't know if it'll be after every guest use when this calmed down. Um, but the resources on BPAA and through you guys, especially the cleanliness stuff, the checklist, I mean, we, we basically took all of that and just put it all into play as one big playbook. I could really go into detail, but I think it was just all the resources, especially from the BPAA site. Beautiful. Um, Mike, how about yourself? What did you find most helpful? Well, there's uh, an abundance of information that's actually almost overwhelming. I've spent more time on the computer watching webinars and things, but, you know, the social distancing, the, the masks, the cleaning, um, we actually bought the light wands I saw in use in a casino to help clean the bowling balls, and it's it's speeded up the time and the ease of doing that quite a bit, but there's there's an abundance of information out there, that's for sure. Beautiful. Dustin, he talked about casinos. Uh, are you using a light wand to clean your bowling balls, or do you have a different method? No, we're not. <clears throat> we just, excuse me, we just have a, uh, a high-end sanitation chemical that we use, and we use that on the entire casino, slot machines, tables, chairs, everything. So Beautiful. we utilize that. Um, yeah, I mean, with a lot of webinars and stuff like that, even during closing, just sit back and just hear you know, like Atlanta and all those centers that opened way before us, you know, just some ideas that they did that I could present to the executive team, you know, on how we could go about this. And like everybody said, the social distancing, the, the sanitation of everything, like, you know, yeah, cleaning out a lot of finger holes and even being a ball driller, I don't think I've drilled as many holes as I have uh, cleaned out. <laughs> right, I can imagine so. Scott, now you were in the middle of a, a remodel project during most of this time, I would assume. So what kind of resources did you find the most valuable for you? Um, the BPAA and the uh, Cubica stuff was all very helpful. I think the thing that we did is we already had plans to remodel. So, um, you know, the old saying, when life hands you lemons, make lemonade. Well, the government handed me a handed me a bushel basket of limes, so I made margaritas. Yeah, what we I love did, it. <laughs> what we did is we included um, our employees, which we paid the entire nine weeks we were closed, and we got them involved with the remodel. Um, they were covering things with plastic. Um, one of my bartenders and one of my cooks, uh, they put up the shiplap in the cafe. So... The employees now have a, I did that kind of attitude on things. And they, it really helped form the team. Um, and the team jumped in with all the stuff from BPAA and Cubica for, for slide things and for Facebook and for the website. And it was, it was really, it was really helpful. 
Beautiful. Well, it seems like many of you took advantage of the reopening marketing kit that we put out. So um, I appreciate that. Um, and if, if our listeners haven't used that yet, it is a resource available to us. Um, if you're just joining us, we're talking with our panel about their experience during reopening. And right now we're talking about kind of what it took to get the doors open. And we're gonna transition a, in a little bit into the response from the public. Um, Donnie, why don't you go on the next question here? Cause I know you've got a couple of important ones here. Absolutely. First of all, I, I really wanted to comment on Scott. I think it's really great that the employees have a new sense of belonging and, and almost ownership. So hats off to you on incorporating them into what was going on. You know, with the different um, states having different restrictions and requirements for you guys to open, um, it created a need to change our, our operating procedures. So I'd like to uh, address that now and discuss with each of you the operating procedures that you have in place uh, now that you have reopened and how they're different than they were before. So let's start, uh, who would like to start that? How about you, Dustin? Can you tell us what new operating procedures that you've had to put in place since reopening? Yeah, um, I think I'm probably right along the lines with everybody else in the industry is, you know, the every other lane um, to allow for social distancing. We do a max of five people per lane. Um, masks are mandatory even while bowling. Um, I elected to go with putting one of each weight on the rack so that when a lane is turned over, I know that I'm wiping down 10 balls, ball return, touchscreen furniture, and I know that that lane is fully sanitized before my next guest takes it. So that was probably one of the biggest things is, and then just taking all the other house balls off of our floor and putting them in the back room um, so that they, we just know that people weren't grabbing things that we could not sanitize. Sure, mm. sure. And what about you, Mike? What operational procedures have you um, put into place since you've reopened? Well, we're we're very similar, and we're sanitizing and and doing every other lane, you know, with with the bowlers. Um, our our customers, we've been open, you know, a little longer, and, and we're a little more isolated. And our customers, a lot of them are unhappy when we try and separate them. They they want to be together. They sure. they want the social interaction. I was very surprised after being closed. You you kind of lose track of, of what your customer wants, you know, and, and it was it was refreshing. We were very fortunate. Uh, only four out of 15 of my leagues elected not to at least do part of their season or complete their season when they came back. So the opening early probably had a little bearing on that too, but our, our sanitizing is, is about like everybody else's. Okay. And Scott, what about you? Is there, uh, is there anything that you're doing that, that we haven't already disclosed here with the other two? Um, no, we pretty much do all those same things. Um, we don't limit it to five on a lane. If a group of eight people come in, we'll put them on a pair. We've got uh, four pairs set aside, two on each end for groups of more than five. Otherwise, we put five on a lane. Um, we try to use even numbered pairs in the afternoon and odd numbered pairs during the day. Uh, our tables are actually seven feet apart. So we can actually use a pair used for two different groups because the tables are far enough apart. And uh, one tip that I'll give you for sanitizing the bowling balls, we were told that 70% alcohol is the best. Well, I have a 55 gallon drum of denatured alcohol for cleaning the approaches. So what we do is we put a little spray bottle we spray it into the holes and then they throw the ball in a, a bowling ball sling like you get at the pro shop. And in 10 seconds, that ball is done. Nice. And the denatured oh. alcohol dries in a matter of seconds. Oh, absolutely. So we Very just spray nice. it in the hole, throw it in the sling, and it's done. Very nice. And Dan, have you, uh, are you pretty much uh, in agreement with what everybody else is doing? Is that kind of what you're doing at your center or have you got anything else uh, as far as new operating procedures? 
I am. It sounds like these guys are right in uh, congruency with me. We did add a bunch of hand sanitizers around the center, right behind the lanes and the POS stations. And then with the best X scoring, before the guests leave the counter now, we put their names in and I actually tell them that the lane will be turned on and you'll have a complete touch-free experience. The retail guests don't even need to touch the screens because if they keep bowling when the game is done, it just keeps on scoring. So I think that's a really nice feature with that scoring system. So mm -hmm because people are hyper aware about what they touch now. So I just love of that. Of course, of course. And you know, really it's just taking your service up a notch. It's really a full service experience for your customer now, which that's, that's just wonderful. I love that. Um, I'm gonna go jump in now. I'm gonna ask uh, you guys, was there anything that you put into place to begin with that you've had to modify or change over time where maybe you found that, you know, it didn't work well or it wasn't effective or something of that nature. Scott, I'll start with you. Did you have anything that you had to change the way you did it after you well, thought you knew what you were doing? Yeah, our, our first league to start back up was the seniors, which was kind of surprising. And, right. and we set it up where they had one team per pair. And mm -hmm. they looked at us and they said, what are you doing? That's not how you bowl league. So they put, them, <laughs> put them on two or there. Um, yeah, it was interesting. But yeah, they were the first ones. And I would say probably three or four percent of the people the first week or so walked into the bowling center with a mask on. And they looked around and they took the mask off and never even thought about it. Yeah, that's what I, I, I've seen that same type of uh, action, me being out in the bowling industry and, and participating. Dan, how about you? Did you change anything up after you've been open for a couple of weeks or is it kind of all the way you envisioned it? No, I did. And to echo what Scott said, we were worried about the guest reaction when they walked in, but we're one fortunate to be in a market, a, a small regional market that was very not really hit by this and also in a state Wisconsin that didn't have a big outbreak. So the guests here aren't as concerned. And what we realized very quickly is the bowlers coming in, and it sounds like Scott got this too, the bowlers that are coming here are just ready to have a good time and don't want to be constantly reminded about the COVID experience. Other people aren't fortunate to be in that kind of a market. But one thing we did was we, just like Dustin did, set up the lanes with all of the different size weight balls. But we noticed after two hours, all the balls were everywhere. So then we were <laughs> it back. And then by the weekend, of course, every single bowling ball was on every single lane across the center. So today I'm actually gonna go back, put them on the racks and just let the guests know, pick out your ball. They've all been sanitized when you're done bowling, just leave them on the rack, we'll take care of it from there. So I don't oh, think a good idea. need to quite set it up, depending, again, that's, that's my market you know, very low uh, case count here. So makes a difference. Sure, sure. Um, also the size of your center makes a difference. If you have a 10 or 12 lane center, that's a little easier to manage on the racks on, on the ball returns than it is in a 40 or 50 lane center. So I, I get that. Uh, Mike, how about yourself? What did you uh, have to change if anything over the last few weeks? Well, I think I'm like everybody else. We, we anticipated the worst and it's, it's actually been better. Um, my my customers don't want to hear about COVID. They they don't believe in the new norm. They they want the old old norm. And and yeah. I think I think we're going to see a lot of that very quickly once these places do start opening. Hopefully, we don't have another outbreak or or things like that. And and I know we're fortunate being in this this smaller market and and stuff like that. It's going to be different everywhere. But I I. I was just really surprised about about my customers. Yeah, well, that that's it's interesting. The human behavior aspect is kind of mapped out across the country. The mentality is mostly the same in in areas that are similarly sized or similarly impacted by the virus. So, uh, if you're in a low impact area, there's less care about it, and that's what we're seeing. I mean, Houston is, I'm in the Houston area, and you would think that we would be uh, super careful because we're one of the hotbeds, or we were one of the higher count areas for a while, but I'm not seeing that. Now, Dustin, you are from Washington, so obviously your state was one of the hardest hits early on. What has your been, what has been your, um, your reactions, or, or did you have to change anything that you started, and are you seeing the same kind of stuff that the other guys are? Um, I'm not getting really a lot of negative feedback on the masks or anything like that. Uh, people are very receptive they, and understanding. To are they required? The uh, yes, they are required. Um, okay. 
you get your comments like, oh, you know, when they're six, seven, eight games in, when they're bowling by themselves in hourly rates and they're starting to sweat, you know, they're like, oh, I just want to pull it down, which we're okay with that, but you do have to have it on at all times. Um, the only thing I really had to change because of the amount of reservations I do was implementing a 30 minute window in between each reservation, which typically you don't like to do because, you know, those total up throughout the day. Um, yeah, that's but money knowing, left on the table. Right. But knowing that the guests are 100 percent sure that that whole area has been sanitized, that 30 minutes is well worth it. And that's where the cleaning mode function in the Cubica software comes into play in Conqueror. So good for you. All right, Dottie, you've got the next question. Yes. Well, this one, you know, we've we've concluded that the customers were really ready to come back and very excited for coming back. But I'm curious um, how each of you promoted your reopening. Uh, I'll start with you, Mike. Well, um, I'm not real techno savvy, but I've got a young man managing for me and we created a, a Facebook live. We'd get on and, and do what I call the Mike and Casey show. And, and we would tell them, you know, about what, what precautions we're taking and what events we had coming up and, and different things like that. And it was very well, well received and, and we get quite a few people watching and stuff. So I would say using Facebook to get our, get our message out to our bowlers was probably our most one of our most effective tools in letting them know that hey we're back we're playing there's things going on it's it seems to be safe and and it, that was probably the probably one of the best tools to to get the word out and, and get us moving forward sure and and that transparency i'm sure was important too for them to see what you guys were doing to make sure that they're experience was safe when they came into the center. And what about you, Dan? How have um, you promoted it? Sure, thanks, Dottie. So early on into this, of course, we were all being educated and understanding. And I had a joke after about three weeks that, you know, I didn't really want to be educated about the coronavirus from my local Chili's because it seemed like every website, every restaurant, <laughs> Every fun venue was like, you know, we're tracking the progress of the coronavirus. I'm like, I really don't care, Chili's. Like, I'll get it from the news stations. So as we got close to opening, this is 10 weeks in, it's been the only thing in the headline and only thing in front of people. So we really took the approach that if people are coming here, they're ready to forget about it. They're ready to be entertained. So we did use Facebook, and I want to dig into that and tell you another thing about it later. But okay. we used Facebook, and we kept it very lighthearted, comical, entertaining, bubbly, like people don't really want to know about all the stuff you were doing. They just want to know you're open and get in here and have a good time. Very mm -hmm. nice. Very nice. And what about you, Dustin? Well, fortunately, I'm thankful enough with being in a casino that, you know, Mary, our director of marketing, uh, her entire staff does a phenomenal job. So I'm kind of fortunate with being in a casino to have an on-site marketing team that just pushed our reopening and, you know, all of our policies and procedures and just blasted the social game like everybody else does. And they did amazing with it. Wonderful. Scott, how did you and Janet promote your reopening? Well, because we were doing um, a lot of renovating during the closure, what we would do is we would take a picture and wouldn't let them know. We'd just show them, take a picture of what, something we had changed. And then we'd ask them where it was, and we were getting 500 and 1,000 views every time on Facebook. Nice. So we did that and just kind of, you know, so where is this little bench? You know, because we, we moved a wall and put an extra bench in the bar, but nobody knew that. And then, mm -hmm. um, so we did things like that, and our daughter-in-law handled it all for us uh, remotely. But um, people had a lot of fun with that, and the – the first couple of days we were open, they all wanted to come see it in real life. Of course. So that, was, it, that worked really well. And it kept the focus uh, away from the, you know, the, the actual pandemic itself. So nice approach. So I'm going to turn it back oh. over to Jay as we're going to transition more into uh, 
the trends and what you've seen in your businesses. Jay? Yeah, I kind of, thanks, Patty. I wanted to talk a little bit about where, you know, the response from your customers, so to speak. Uh, what have you seen from your business in regards to, let's ask this, have there been any unexpected challenges upon reopening from the customer point of view? Uh, Mike, I'll start with you. Have you had any of those? Not, not really. Uh, the, you know, just we, we had leagues that had five or six weeks left, and we'd have maybe a night or something where we would double them up in, in, in that week's time frame. So scheduling and, and getting everybody on the same page was, was a little difficult with, with moving them around and getting them off their normal league night. But it was very well received, and, and it all went pretty good. Okay. Um, was there anything that worked out? Well, I guess you could say that did work out better than you anticipated then. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. I'll go to Dustin next. Dustin, were there any unexpected challenges that you faced uh, with your customer base as you reopened? Uh, no. Uh, I think, you know, as of last week with being the only center open in the entire state of Washington, um, people have just been thankful to have a place to go bowl. So there's been no negative feedback or anything. They've just always been like, thank you for opening. Uh, a lot of youth bowlers, a lot of league bowlers, uh, just very thankful to have a place to come. Nice. Um, Dan? Yeah, it broke up. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah, I can hear you. Yep. Were there any okay. unexpected challenges that you had uh, or, you know, with the, with the customer base that you reopened? Yeah, the only thing was a few questions from our fall league bowlers that didn't get to finish the season, and we haven't seen them. They were just curious, and I had this from four different bowlers, which to me was a large demographic reaching out, um, wondering about next season. Will we, we, will we be bowling next season? So I think it was a lot of our job to calm that down and just be the optimistic one until we knew something. We're all hopeful that this dies down, and thank goodness the protests for two reasons have taken the headlines, but one, that it's away from the coronavirus. Um, but I think it's just calming the market. A lot of that league angle and even the open play angle that we're open, we're ready, mm -hmm. and that everything is going to be fine. We might as well just keep saying that we're ready. Come have a good time. Don't worry about next season. It's all green light from here until it doesn't happen. And then, you know, what are you going to do? Yeah. And, Scott, you, uh, you had the interesting story with your seniors. Anything else that was unexpected or um, that worked out better than you anticipated with your customer base? No, everything, what the, other, what the other people said is pretty much what we saw. Um, I was expecting people to come in and be paranoid about other people not wearing masks or being too close, and that never happened. Everybody comes in and, oh, I'd say 75% of them observe the social distancing. The others don't. The seniors shocked me. They came in, and they were all like long-lost friends hugging and we're like, wow. Mm. Which is odd because they're one of the high risk communities, right? Yep. I get it. Yep. Well, it's interesting yep. we're going into the league area because uh, Dennis from Double Decker Lanes in California is asked, how are you organizing your leagues for your center? Every other lane, two shifts. What do you think of organizing trios leagues using all the lanes with social distancing being the main concern? And I'll tell you, Dennis, from my point of view, I just bowled this past weekend in San Antonio at a trios tournament. There was no every other lane. There was a 36 team uh there were 36 teams and a 42 lane center so there were just three pairs that weren't being used and they was the end pairs in one middle and that was the deal you know social distance like scott said at your own will we're not going to be that police um but what are you guys see seeing that um dustin uh you are you having any well you don't you don't you have leagues there correct dustin you have a couple of leagues talk to me yeah, about what your plan is for those leagues yeah i have four leagues um my league's actually all elected to not finish. And the main reason for that was is because I didn't open my doors until late August of 2019. So I had already kind of had a late start with all the other centers around me with league base. Mm -hmm. um, and with them having to come back and finish, it would have pushed them, in, pushed them into another late start for the next season. So everybody was on board with just, hey, let's just call it you know, a year, return to everybody's prize money, and uh, that way we can start on time in August. Oh, nice. How about you, Mike? Um, it was kind of interesting. One of my leagues, you know, we did lose a few teams, 
um, due to their work and not allowing them to get out and stuff. But I, I actually had a couple call and said, our, our, our partners don't want to bowl, but we would love to come back. We want to get out of the house. Can you put us with somebody else? And we, we had another team kind of basically do the same thing. And, and we got them out of the house to bowl. They were, they were that, that ready to come back and play the game that it, it was just, it was just amazing to, to get that kind of response and get that phone call, you know, from somebody that wanted to play and get out that bad. I'm sure it was. Um, Dan, uh, you are planning anything different for the fall leagues or are you go as it used to be for now? Yeah, we're going to go as it used to be. I mean, I, I assume that a lot of the people are well educated now on best practices. And I was telling a staff member the other day that if you take this back to before March 14th and just started everything up again, then of course we'd be in the same rut again. But even if we put everybody back in the same lanes, the bowling center has it on their shoulders to change their practices and add a lot of safer things that make them very comfortable for that. The sanitizer, the small things we're doing at the bar, getting rid of the popcorn machine, suggesting fruit, plastic wear that's wrapped now. We're doing a lot of stuff that's going to keep them a lot safer than they would ever have been in a bowling center in the last, I don't know, 150 years. So if they're, <laughs> right. comfortable, enough, if they're comfortable enough to come in and they don't feel like they're the high risk ones, then I think it's our job just to make sure they're having a good time. We already put all the stuff into place. Nice. And Scott, you've already kind of illustrated that point with your seniors. Are you going to plan to uh, come back as you've been for the past few well, years? Uh, uh, my, the same my, this year? my summer leagues are starting uh, tonight and tomorrow night, and they are um, they are all planning on bowling, you know, two teams per pair. Um, the leagues aren't quite as big, but that's normal for the summer. Right. Um, and then as far as the fall is concerned, no, we plan on – uh, everything bowling as usual. What we're going to do, though, is leave the tables like they are now. We moved them back a little bit on the concourse to give a little bit more separation. So the tables on the pair are over seven feet apart. Yeah, and your tables were already kind of far apart to begin with, I remember. So that yeah. was nice that you had that ability to do that there. All right, Dottie, I'm going to hand it off to you for the next question. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Jay. You know, one of the things that we've talked about is um, having the procedures in place and we're cleaning more. And uh, so that means that there is a new responsibility for our staff members. And I'm curious what the attitude of your staff members have been to this. You know, I, I hesitate to use new norm, but what has the staff members attitude been towards this new norm? Um, Scott, you want to share with us what your employees are, you know, what's the feedback from your employees? How are they feeling? I don't think I've heard any complaints at all. They just, they just do what they need to do. And they know as soon as the people leave, you know, they were always charged with as soon as they leave to go clean it up, return the balls to the rack. Now they clean it up, sanitize the balls and leave them on the racks. And I don't, I mean, we didn't really change a lot. We are more visible wiping down the tables and the chairs, but we always did that. But we're just a little bit more visible doing it now. Very nice. And what about you, Dustin? How's the attitude of the employees? Do they seem to be getting used to this new norm? Yeah, um, I mean, they're they're excited to make the experience the best. I mean, if it takes wiping down certain things in front of people uh, to make that comfort level higher. Um, I have a great team under me and they're just grateful to be back, uh, grateful to be in, you know, a bowling center again. And, you know, they just do what they got to do to make the guest experience the best it can be. Sure. Dan, the, the new guidelines and protocols for your staff members, how have they reacted? Yeah, overall, very positive. Again, I think it's their self-education. And one, they, they saw a lot of the standards we put in place. We did have a bartender that had breast cancer a few years ago, and she was very concerned early on. But she developed a few techniques, you know, a little more plastic gloves. Um, we keep her a certain, you know, number of feet away from most of the guests and kind of tweaked her shifts and everything's fine. So again, I think a lot of it was on the bowling center shoulders. Once they saw that we took this seriously and we put a lot of changes into place as far as cleaning. And I love that Scott said they're more visible. I've used that word optics. The optics of us actually being out there cleaning while the guests see it, it does matter. It's tangible and it matters for the staff. So I think we made it comfortable. So they're comfortable. 
very nice. And same goes for you, Mike. Am I correct? We had visited a little bit about the your uh, your staff members and how involved that they were in your reopening. So the reaction from your staff members has been positive as well, I assume. Absolutely. I've got a few that you know, I have a little phobia with the masks or their glasses fog up when they wear them. <laughs> but other than that, it's it's they they've they've wanted to get back to work. They miss the people. They they enjoy our customers. So it's 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 always been positive. That's really good. You know, and and uh, I assume none of you had any challenges with getting the employees to come back. I know we have had a few proprietors that have struggled a little bit with that because the employees prefer to, to stay furloughed for a little bit longer. So did any of you have any um, trouble getting the employees to come back to work? No. Nope. No. That's that's great news. Great. News. No, it's good to hear. We lost we lost two, um, but we were okay with that. Okay. <laughs> it I, hear you, out. I hear you. <laughs> Sometimes you're okay with losing a couple certain ones. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna ask the next. Uh, Dottie, is it is it my turn? I want to just make sure I don't want to step on you here. Yeah. Go. Okay. Ask. You know we. Thanks. Uh, I had on the Beyond the Frame a couple of weeks ago, I had Anthony Peroni on and he, he was sharing his story about, you know, putting his video up, etc. And he shared that uh, they had been open for several weeks at that point, I think three or four, and his revenue continued to grow week over week. And actually, over the Memorial Day weekend, he said he beat last year's revenue, which I found just completely uh, shocking, but also just you know, heartwarming to hear, like, I'm just glad that, you know, our industry is coming back. So I'm going to ask each one of you, how have sales income compared with the norm at this time of year? For those of you that have been open, right? Have you seen a, a rise week over week? And are you at a level where you're okay with it? Or do you still have room to grow? Uh, Dan, start with you this time. Oh, we have tons of room to grow. We just got the center in January and we didn't have a lot of financials from previous year. And of course it is summer and beautiful here in mid Wisconsin where people go to their cabins. But even over the two weeks we've been open, we've seen, you know, 10, 20% over those two weeks. Now that people are realizing one that we're open and two that we have good standards and they're coming back. So I'm very optimistic about that. Awesome. Uh, Mike, I'll go to you. Well, with as many leagues as I have finishing up, yeah, I've been extra busy compared to, to last year. So um, we started the summer bowl pass program last year and it seems to be gaining momentum this year and, and we seem to be busier. So I'm I'm looking forward to a little better summer hopefully than, than I've had in the past. So I'm I'm optimistic about what's gonna happen. Well I like what I'm hearing. Dustin, are you gonna confirm this? <laughs> I know you haven't uh, been open for a full year yet or just a full year, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'm, I'm just right about that seven, eight month mark, you know, with August being an opening. Um, but I'm noticing if I just go month to month, um, even being only use, able to use eight lanes, I'm running above 50% comparison. So I'm doing extremely okay. well. I'm, I'm booked out my next three weekends. So they're, they're back. <laughs> yeah. And Scott, is it the same similar situation for you? Well, we've noticed that our birthday parties have dropped off almost completely. But the 18 days that I have the records of that we've been open, for those 18 days, we averaged about 70% of our normal revenue. Wow. Um, this, pa this past Sunday, we hit it almost exactly at 100%. So we were, we were thrilled with that. Yeah, I would be too. Good job. All right, Dottie, you're up. Yes, actually, we had a, uh, a viewer that sent in his question ahead of time. So I'm going to put that out there and uh, see if we can't get an answer for Andrew. Um, does it appear that guests are staying as long as usual or making shorter visits? Has anyone um, paid attention to that? And do you have feedback on that? Uh, any of you? I think it's normal for me. Okay. Well, that's good to hear. And I would echo I that. that. I would say, I I'm sorry, I would say normal or longer because there's nothing really else to do. Movie theaters still closed. We're kind of the entertainment venue for them to go to. So it's very positive. I 100%. Yeah, oh, sorry. I did, that. Yeah, this is Scott. What we did is when we first opened, 
We did it by time bowling only. We were worried about, you know, capacity and stuff. We could only open at 25% and things like that. Um, I would say that now that we do it by time or game, I would say most people, mm -hmm. once they get bowling, they just keep bowling. They're, they're actually staying longer. Very nice. Right. We also had another question just coming, uh, just came in through the chat. Um, and this is from um, Jim Gordon, Yosemite Lanes in Modesto, California, asking, did you raise prices when you reopened or did you leave the pricing the same? Uh, Dustin? Uh, we stayed the same. Mike? Stayed the same. How about you, Dan? We stayed the same and also added a few more specials and happy hour stuff. So I would say actually lowered across. Okay, very nice. And what about you, Scott? Uh, we did we did a nineteen dollars an hour for COVID nineteen plus shoes. Our normal rate is twenty six. Um, food pricing and and drink prices we have not raised yet. We figured we'd wait till we're closer to a hundred percent, and we'll probably do that uh, just as the fall leagues are starting up. Very nice. Very nice. All right. Well, I thank you to Andrew Medeiros from Bowl Orama uh, Family Fun Center in New Hampshire for that question. And thanks to Cynthia for, at, or to Jim Gordon, sorry. <laughs> Registered under Cynthia. That's why I got it mixed up. I'm going to go back to uh, a statement Jim Grant's on, and he said that he has a 12 lane center. For those of you who don't know Jim, Jim is one of our our district sales manager. So he has a lot of centers that he deals with in Northwest Wisconsin, Dan, in your neck of the woods. Um, and he said he had a 12 lane center that he had two week numbers for in late May and early June that are up considerably from the previous year. So it kind of echoes the same statements you've all been making. Um, and again, also Ron uh, Ghetto says Starlight Lanes in Arizona has been open for 12 days for each week for three weeks, and they're now up to 60% of normal revenue year over year, but only for four days a week. So I'd say he's also um, also getting himself in a good position. A long way to go though, right? Um, my next question is about uh, your casual open play business. And I'm gonna assume this answer is yes across the board. It says, you know, have you started to see your casual open play business pick up? It's all been mostly casual open play for all of you, correct? Well, Dustin, for you, for sure, right? You have no leagues finishing. And then Mike, you do have leagues that are finishing, but has your open play business been much higher than it normally would be at this time of year? I believe so, yes. We're, we're, we're seeing, uh, it's hard to gauge because this summer bowl pass, this is just our second year of it, but I, I feel like we've, we've really caught something by the tail and it, it seems to be helping out my summer. So I, I, I know part of it is, is due to that, but what we're seeing people come in and, and play by the game or by the hour also. So it's the, the overall, it, it, it looks good. It, it, people want something to do. Yeah. Now, Dan, when you were with uh, Bolero and back when you worked with AMX back in the day, the summer bowl pass was a thing that you actually, I remember when you took over Buffalo, you started to sell that summer pass differently than what was mandated by corporate to, uh, to uh, uh, amplify your income. And I'm asking, have you uh, started that program up there in Wisconsin or do you plan to for maybe next year? We definitely will do that next year. We actually piggyback with the Kids Bowl Free, which I wasn't a huge fan of before owning my own center. But then I saw the database that we inherited, and I saw 500 names on there with their addresses, phone numbers, the kids' days, the birth dates. And I was like, the database alone is worth doing this program. But I, again, I'm in a Midwest market and a Northern market, and when the weather turns, you got to drag them indoors. So anything you can do with a summer pass, and it sounds like most centers are very creative, to get them back for those repeat visits, I mean, you just got to go all in on it. Yeah, for sure. Scott, how about you? Are you running any kind of uh, summer pass? And do you see, uh, obviously, it's, you're just starting leagues now. So all of your business has been, I'm assuming, casual and open play before. Correct. Um, we are. We did not start our summer pass yet this year. We we are going to probably start it um, for just for July and August. We we had some issues with our because we tore everything apart. And I'll just give anybody um, a word of advice. If you take apart your scoring system and your point of sale, <laughs> when you put it back together, make sure you took pictures of everything. Oh my God. <laughs> yes, thoroughly before you reopen. 
Now, I don't don't anybody ask me how I know this, okay? <laughs> that is some very sound advice, Scott. Thank you for that. All right, I'm going to ask you: Have you have you any of you planned to offer any unique experiences, or maybe you have offered a unique experience already? Maybe an event honoring like frontline workers or graduates or something of that nature. Mike, I'll start with you. Actually, our city has shut down our Fourth of July already, limiting us to just fireworks. And there's a group uh, locally that's trying to put on the pancake feed and the volleyball and some of that. So we're planning on um, probably getting involved with that, helping to do a fundraiser or something to to facilitate that. And also, I with all the riots and everything, I'm, I'm working on some ideas to possibly do something to honor our PD and our sheriff's office, you know, and maybe even some of our first responders or some plans that we're looking at maybe later in July and stuff like that. Nice. Dustin, how about yourself? Um, our marketing team has some things in the work. We currently aren't offering anything, um, but there's some things in the works that our marketing team is, is uh, going through. Well, when you're sold out for three weeks ahead, it's kind of hard to offer a special program. So maybe that's a back burner item for your particular place. Uh, Dan, how about yourself? Do you, are you going to offer any kind of uh, special event? We did, right when we opened, we took around to the local grocery stores, the Dunkin' Donuts I drove through every day, the Starbucks I drove through all the time, and dropped off these thank you, you packets. So it had a, a bunch of free games in there. It also had an invite specifically for the manager to bring their associates when they could when things settled down on them and reminded them of our space. Again, we're a 48-lane center, and the advantage of that is we have a lot of space. They can have an isolated experience just for their team when they come in. So that was one thing, and now we're starting to invite – um, on three separate days on very slow times, an hour of free bowling to get people back in here. And I think you just got to get outside the building and start inviting them back. Because I do think there's a portion of the market that doesn't realize that bowling centers are open yet. I would agree with that. Absolutely. Dottie, well, you had it, something to say. Yes, I was just going to say community involvement is so great. And, and I think that that's one thing that we've really seen, you know, in, in every situation, we try to find that silver lining. And I think that many communities have been brought together because of this pandemic and they've really worked together to get through it. And I think that, you know, to continue that is, is really important and it's going to have benefits uh, for many, many weeks to come. Um, I, I do want to ask, we did have a question come in uh, asking from Evan uh, Trisler, has there been any concern on shoe rental from your guests? None. None, None. for me. That's None for me. That's, that's great. I think sometimes we just need to, you know, as we said, just go on uh, with business as usual and be very transparent with our cleaning process. And I think things are going to fall into place. So as we are sort of uh, coming up to the hour here, one of the things that we always like to do is, you know, find out, do you have, and, and we'll go um, down the row and ask each of you this question, what advice would you give centers that are getting ready to open? Dustin? Uh, I would probably just say patience. Um, you know, mm. The world, I mean, it's changed. You know, we're, this isn't a life we're used to living. And, you know, to come in and bowl with a mask or to be separated from your friends or whatever the case may be. So I think just being patient with the guests and your customers and having them understand that, you know, we're in this with them. So we're just trying to give them something to do and exciting and safe and sanitation at the same time. Um, so I would just say patience. Very nice, very nice. And Mike, what about you? What advice would you give centers that are getting ready to open? Well, it's kind of expect the worst and hope for the best. You know, <laughs> we we prepare we prepare for this pandemic and, and people's response, but I, I don't I don't think the people are going to are responding the, the way I anticipated them to. They're they're more like minded. Um, in, in my area anyway than than uh, than everybody else they're not as worried about all this stuff and, and they want to get back they don't want a new norm they want the old norm well you know bowling is such a, a social sport and, and that's 
you know, as much of the experience is being with other people and stuff. So it's nice to hear that. It's nice to see that be the response of your customers coming in as well. And, and Dan, what about you? What advice would you give centers that are getting ready to open? Yeah, to echo Mike with that old normal, they're coming here as comfort. We know we have relationships and we're kind of part of the community. So my main advice would be don't remind the guests at every turn about the pandemic. Don't have signage up that says due to the pandemic, due to COVID. Like just take down your popcorn machine and leave it away. They're going to understand. Beyond that, it's again on our shoulders to have the best practices. Make sure your place smells great. Our bathrooms never smelled that great. So we really were diligent about adding some stuff in there and checking on it every four hours and just making sure everything smells clean, looks clean. The last thing I'll say is about Facebook. If you're not using the boost option on Facebook, to promote the business and any events or to say when you're going to reopen, then you're missing out. This is like five or $10. You can micro market around your center and it really has a reach. So I challenge anybody that has not used that feature when you're using your social media on Facebook, very cheap, very effective way to get out there. I agree. I agree. And Scott, what about you? What advice would you give centers uh, that haven't yet reopened and are getting ready to? What what advice do you have for them? Okay, I've got I've got three pearls here. Okay, One, we're ready. Test all your systems before you open. <laughs> uh, number two, um, denatured alcohol as a sanitizer in 55 gallon drums is very cost effective. Okay. And. And the one that really caught me off guard is um, make sure your beer distributor has Bud Light available in kegs because I can't get Bud Light <laughs> or Michelob Ultra in kegs. They're, they don't have You're it. You're not alone. Yeah, they don't have it. Really? Oh, it's so interesting. It's so interesting. The first there time are I've heard certain of beverages. Mm hmm. All right. Well, uh, that's I've, 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 I personally have experienced not being able to get certain beverages also. And I, I look in multiple stores and it's just not on the shelf. And I thought they must have scaled back their production for some reason or, you know, it's only available in cans. It's not in a two liter, you know, something like that. So and the beer, uh, obviously, the same way. So, uh, you know, I want to thank our webinar, our attendees for attending today's webinar and our panel. You guys are just awesome. If there's any other questions you want to ask, go ahead and put them in the chat now. Um, and while we're going to wrap our day up here today, I want to just mention that we have uh, our Cubic AMF resources. We've updated our resource center page and uh, it's beautiful and it's more organized now than it ever has been before. So uh, you can go to cubicaams.com slash support slash resource center. It's not fully listed up in our, on the, uh, the graphic here, but it's dot com slash support slash resource center. And obviously when you go to cubicaams.com, you'll be able to see that there too. Um, we've got maintaining your equipment, best practices for bowling operations, and also additional industry resources. It's categorized, easy to find. Welcome back to bowling center reopening marketing kit. That's the Cubica AMF marketing kit that we put together completely free. Don't reinvent the wheel. If you haven't uh, opened yet and you're going to have to put a plan together with signage, uh, with uh, other materials, it's already created for you. Just take it and use it as you see fit. Um, our Beyond the Frame group, which is our Facebook Live group uh, and our tech support group, all the content that we've created for our customers and have aired in the past is available both there at Beyond the Frame and Facebook, but also on our YouTube channel. So you can find it in a couple different places. And in two weeks from today, we will be having another webinar. And our next webinar on the 24th of June is going to be uh, refocusing on your business. Um, we're going to help you learn more about web booking, time bowling, and other operational considerations so you can build that into your new process when you reopen your business and hit the ground running. Uh, Guillaume, uh, Mr. Magnet from Canada, thanks for joining us today. He sent me a little private message. I just want to give him a shout out. And to Zach Carey from Pinheads, thanks for joining us along with everybody else. I couldn't I can't mention everybody's name, but there's so many familiar names in that group over there. Um, okay. And the fine, yes, dear. Yes, I just wanted to mention, you know, Scott uh, is not going to be alone. And as he's turning on the equipment and putting things back 
uh, together that everything just didn't fall into place and work as normal. So I just want to mention that Cubica AMF uh, from our resource page uh, has uh, a tech support uh, assistance for just that. So if you are getting ready to reopen and you need a little guidance or have some things that uh, you have questions on, make sure that you go to the tech support uh, portion of the website and they have a, they will be willing to walk through those uh, processes with you, as well as a number of documents that kind of walk you through the reopening process to make it a little bit easier. So make sure that you check yeah. this out for getting ready to reopen. Thanks for reminding me, Dottie. And I believe you can also schedule a call where they'll call you back and at the time, you know, there's a schedule available there, um, right? And we also have another service, which is a virtual classroom. You may have staff that's been gone for a while. The virtual classroom will help uh, give them a refresher course on, you know, Conqueror and the basic, uh, just basic stuff. So if you have new staff that may have not been trained or you've got staff that, that could use that refresher, that's also a free service uh, class that takes place a couple times a week. So look, look there for that. I'm gonna look to see if we have any other question. Uh, Todd from Coconut Bowl in Sparks, Nevada says they're running summer leagues on single lanes. In terms of exporting league names to lanes, does BLS have a workaround to accommodate single lanes? This is a good question, Todd. I apologize that I can't tell you the answer right off the top of my head, but I do know that uh, our last webinar, the le was it last week? The, yeah, I believe it was last week. We had, uh, two weeks ago, we had Lance Rasmussen from uh, BLS on, and they were doing some special things based on the guidance that USBC has changed on some of the rules where they're allowing play on one lane. So if it's not in BLS at the moment, maybe you might have to update your BLS. I am assuming that they are making uh, uh, some adjustments. So that is an option for you to use. Okay. Uh, so it, if we have no more questions come in, I'm going to thank you for your time one more time. And if you'd like to ask questions uh, on today's webinar topic to either us or any of the panelists, you can email us at info at cubicaamf.com and that will, uh, that will get us well, there's now info at Cubic AMF's not on the screen. Just pretend, everyone, that it says info at cubicaamf.com up there, uh, or max training admin at cubicaamf.com. So you can get us either place and join us for our next webinar on June 24th. Uh, for Jay Nephew, Dottie San Martin, all of our guests, I appreciate your time. We thank you for joining us today. Go out there, make everyone happy, make bowling amazing, and have a great week. Thanks, man.